Right. Okay. Good morning, everyone. So today we will start our first lecture of this advanced quantum mechanics course. So let me just mention this. It's supposed to be an advanced course. Okay. In other words, uh, it's a second course for quantum mechanics in this curriculum. Uh, but the basic idea of this uh, course is not to go into the fundamentals so much, but now more on the application side. So you get to do more realistic uh, calculations. So when they do uh, experiments, uh, one can actually do uh, or try to solve a, a physical system, which has uh, no, a bit more complicated to do solve using the, the fundamentals then you actually you are actually taught to do how to do it okay so the first thing that we're going to go through is essentially angular momentum but let me just um, open this thing can you see this oh sorry i have not shared it sorry uh, let me share my screen Okay, uh, I suppose you can can now see this. Okay, so uh, essentially this is the assessment plan for this particular course. So there will be quiz, assignment, test 1, test 2. So test 1, test 2 will be 15%. Uh, your quiz uh, is 5%. Assignment it's 10%. There will be an SAL which is 15%. Okay. So since there are only two of you, your SEL will again be, will, will not be uh, group work. Okay? So similarly for your assignment. Okay? In other words, you, you can hand in uh, your assignments uh, individually. Okay? Uh, but of course you can actually you know, discuss among each other. Uh, your SEL is also probably you have to do it individually since there are only two of you. Uh, and then your final exam is 40%. Okay, so that should total up to 100. Okay, that's 100 there. And uh, I wish there are, there are a few more students. I'm not sure what happened to my final year project students. <laughs> okay. But uh, they should be taking this. Uh, let me just show you uh, some of the reference books that uh, I tend to. Is there somebody coming in? Okay, Fauzi. All right. Uh, there is supposed to be uh, reference books uh, that you can actually look up to. Okay, uh, the first two is probably the main ones because my, my notes are basically based on these two books. Uh, but sometimes I have to go through different books. Uh, reference 3 is essentially an easier book to look at. Okay. And uh, of course, Reference 5 is uh, written by Nobel laureate. So I will refer this only, you know, uh, rarely you know, perhaps in certain topics like if we get to the uh, to the end of this course there should be a relativistic quantum mechanics so those uh, that topic will be referring to Weinberg and Scadron okay so most probably you no know, depends on how fast we go then uh, Hopefully we get to that, that relativistic quantum mechanics. Then uh, you'll be able to see uh, that your equation of quantum mechanics is going to be changed. Right. So essentially, those are the two books. I've shared uh, three books in Putra Blast, so you can simply download those. And uh, so let me go to the lecture. Oh, before that. Uh, I will be assuming certain things. 
uh, for for this particular course but since i'm not teaching the the first course of quantum mechanics so i'm not sure whether they are uh, actually uh, being taught or not so you have to tell me okay if something is unfamiliar then uh, just mention it to me then i'll probably go through some basics of it okay so today uh close this so today, today we'll be uh, looking at angular momentum. So this will be a revision. So I'm not sure what have you done in your first course. Uh, I assume that you have done orbital angular momentum. Can somebody say? Yeah, we did, we did a bit of it. The, the general theory? General theory and then Dr. Narisha went a bit into the hydrogen atom. Yeah, okay, so, so in other words, you have gone through it. So uh, we'll be uh, um, making some revisions of the concepts that we're going to use. So let me just... So these are uh, essentially... Uh, so let me get my pen here. So we'll go through some, some uh, the basic theory of angular momentum, the, the, the general case. So essentially there will be three different uh, observables. Maybe I should turn to it. Okay, uh, there will be three, three different observables that one look at. Maybe I'm just underline that. So, and these are normally given uh, uh, as components of X and Y and Z, but it's not necessarily uh, related in a direct way to your X, Y, Z. But in other words, you just have a set of three observables, J, X, J, Y, J, Z, for which uh, they have a, uh, the commutators in this uh, particular red box here. So your, your, your individual components, I can now say just components because I label it by X, Y, and Z. So for each different component, they, are, they don't have a zero commutator. So in other words, none of the angular momentum components are compatible with, with each other, okay? So JX, JY, when you take the commutator, will give you JZ multiplied by h bar. Similarly, jx, jy, it gives you jx, multiplied by h bar, and also jz, jx, will be giving you jy, multiplied by h bar. And uh, the important thing that you need to observe in this particular case is that your, there is a pattern towards this commutator uh, algebra thing. So you can see that it's a kind of a cyclic uh, uh, thing. So I can scribble here, for example. So you have, for example, this kind of uh, cyclic algebra. So if you take X and Y, it gives you Z. If you take Y and Z, it will give you X. And if you take Z and X, it will give you Y. So that cyclic property is actually uh, is known as uh, uh, no, it's re it reflects to some kind of uh, rotational symmetry. We will see later on that your angular matter are essentially generators of rotations. Okay. So uh, one could condense this. Uh, uh, not what you call this set of commutators into a single one using the uh, Ly Shivita symbol for the alternating center uh, tensor, sorry, which is given by the symbol IJK. I believe you have seen this before. So, so if it's uh, if your IJK is uh, essentially uh, an even permutation of one, two, three, then you get one. Okay, 
if you odd permutation then you get minus one anything else which means actually it's going to be a one a one pair will be the same then uh, this will be equal to zero okay so uh, all of these uh, what you call commutators can be condensed into a single one uh, but written in as abstract form uh, using this uh, symbol of i and k for example so this is actually okay maybe i should this is j so i will update this later on okay. so this is j i j j so you see the the free index is i and j here so on the right hand side there will be a free index i and j but uh, there will be another index which we call the dummy index okay your k here will be summed from one to three okay so using the properties of your epsilon i j k equals to one minus one or zero depending on what your i j k is you should be able to get all these uh, commutators out so you'll be a uh, instruct exercise just to, to, to do this at least once okay. so that is so essentially that gives you what we call the angular momentum algebra uh, one of the problems uh, that one has with with respect to this angular momentum thing is the the fact that none of them is com compatible so none commutes none of the com components commute each other uh, so uh, when you try to label uh, angular momentum states you need compatible observables so in other words over here you can only use one of the components okay uh, normally one use uh, J, jz okay uh, you pick one of the components and label it, uh, angular momentum state uh, but that is not good enough. One can do a uh, combination of your jx, jy, jz. In this manner, this is your j squared. So your j squared are essentially, uh, if you think of your jx, jy, jz as your components of a vector, for example, then your j squared will be the squared magnitude of angular momentum. Okay. So in other words, uh, you'll be able to show that this j squared, if you take the commutator with any of this, uh, oh, again, uh, I should be, no man, okay, I, I'll change this later. If you take any any of these uh, components, jx, jy, jz, and take the commutator with, with j squared, so in other words, what I wanted to do here, again, uh, I should update this later on. So uh, if you already download your notes, you probably need to download this again. So uh, the, the components themselves will commute with J squared. So in other words, J squared is a compatible uh, uh, observable or operator uh, with any of the components. So one could actually use uh, the eigenvalues of j squared and the eigenvalue of one of the components, in this case usually j z, to actually label your uh, angular momentum state. Okay? So normally we write it in this particular form, j m as your angular momentum state, where j corresponds to yeah so when you add j squared on j m gives you a j j plus one h bar squared j m so in other words j m is an eigenstate of j squared with these eigenvalues and remember here uh, h bar is already uh, carrying you the uh, what you call dimensions of angular momentum So in other words, uh, your j are all your j is dimensionless. Okay. 
so that's uh, the reason why you have your h bar squared there so uh and what is m m is uh, uh is the eigenvalue of your the, the component that you choose here for example is jz so it gives you uh jz acting on jm gives you m h bar jm again this is the uh dimension of angular momenta here and this will be dimensionless okay so your j is sometimes called an angular momentum quantum number and your mj is sometimes called secondary angular momentum quantum number or the magnetic quantum number okay uh, why it's called magnetic you'll see later on uh, when we talk about uh, interactions of your angular momenta with with uh, the magnetic field now what is j and m precisely so again uh, my notation here maybe i should remove this so this is m so what is j j in general can be uh, a half integer okay uh, n will be integers 0, 1, to 3. So your j in general can be n over 2. Okay. So in other words, uh, if I choose n equals to 0, there's only one. Well, I mean, it will be just an integer there. But if I choose 1, then it will be a half integer. Okay. So, and then your m will go from minus j to j plus j okay so in other words there, there will always be a two two j plus one different values of n uh, uh, for each j okay. so these are supposed to be proven in the first course uh, if you like to see the proof then probably you need to see uh, my notes or in Dr. Norisha has already uh, shown this, you can actually prove this, okay? So, uh, okay, so that's that. Uh, so once you uh, choose a particular component, uh, in this case, JZ, then uh, one might ask, what's the use of the other components? Well, one can use it in a, in a, in a subtly uh, different way. Uh, you can combine Jx and Jy to give two other different components, uh, two other different operators. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it's called the ladder operators, uh, which is given by J plus and J minus, where J plus is given by Jx plus Ijy. And you can see that, oh, I've forgotten to say that your all your J's are, are Hermitian because they are physical observable. Okay. So in other words, they have real eigenvalues. So, but your J plus and J minus, you can see there's an I in the uh, definition. So that makes it uh, your J plus and J minus not to be Hermitian. In fact, uh, J plus essentially is J minus adjoint and J minus is actually J plus adjoint. Okay. So what you can do with this ladder operators? Well, one of the things that uh, one usually needs is how the ladder operators acts on JM. Okay. So one of the things that uh, happens to this eigenvalue when well, I mean the the eigenstate will change to something else but it will be changing in a specific way in a way that your M gets raised by one unit of H bar okay or it gets decreased by one unit of H bar so it will just change accordingly with this uh, plus or minus there okay so that's why it's called the ladder operator. So it sort of starts to shift your M values up or down. Okay. And there'll be some uh, combination of these uh, ladder operators. 
that be, should be convenient for us to use. For example, your j plus or minus dagger times j plus or minus, you know that it's going to be a, a, a positive operator. Okay. And this positive operator is none other than this uh, operators combined in this manner. So it's a combination of your j squared, your jz squared, and your jz. Okay. And from here, you can also rewrite your j squared minus jz squared as the uh, I call the average product, sorry, average uh, of this ordering of j plus and j minus. And this is again also a positive operand. Okay. Okay. Uh, so again, these are things that you're supposed to have come across in the first course. So I'm just uh, summarizing the results. Uh, so the next thing is, okay, once you have a set of bases given by your eigenstates, your JM, one can start to uh, uh, what I call form matrix representation of the angular momentum operators. Okay, uh, so uh, a general angular momentum, uh, so a general element of an angular momentum operator, it can be written this way. So you have uh, some numbers j dash m dash over here and then a different number j m for the j square and j z they are going to be diagonal okay so in other words what it means to be diagonal is that they have to have the same j and j dash and the same m and m dash so you have this chronicle delta there okay so in other words uh, you will see it, for example later on that your j z will be something like this Okay, so it's going to be a diagonal operator. Okay. And your j plus j minus uh, from the, uh, the, the formula of uh, how j plus x on jm, you can find that this will not be uh, a diagonal uh, matrix because you can see that, okay, it will be either, uh, in this case, this one will be on top of the diagonal and this one will be at the bottom of the diagonal okay so uh, the best thing to look at this thing uh, and also of course you can invert the combination of j plus and j minus to get your jx and jy okay because you can always uh, rewrite them in this way j plus and j minus the combination of j plus and j minus will give you jx and then another combination of j plus and j minus will give you j y. Okay. Uh, normally, what happens is sometimes uh, your interaction in your quantum systems fix your uh, your magnitude of angular momentum. So, in other words, j is fixed. So, you want for one essentially can forget about j in a way and just look at how m varies uh, from one value to another. Okay. Of course, this is not true in general, but no, uh, for Coulombic system, for example, is is conserving the, the the rotational symmetry. Then you find that your angular moment, uh, magnitude of angular momentum is conserved. So at j equals zero, for example, we can start uh, writing down your matrix elements. Okay, so you just simply vary now your j is fixed. You simply vary your m and remember that your m goes from minus m to plus m but since m is going to uh, going to take the, the value of your j really so in other words the maximum here is actually j so here will be minus j here will be your plus j but since j is zero there's only one uh, eigenvalue of m which is uh, zero so in other words there's only one by one matrix which is essentially a number and this is uh, particularly obvious in some sense because uh, what does it say that uh, since there is no uh, magnitude of angular momentum then your angular momentum kind of uh, matrix is just a scalar okay 
So the next step will be j equals to half. Okay. So when j equals to half, so you'll see that uh, it begins from minus j minus a half. And then remember the increment will be a plus one. So minus half plus a plus one is going to be a plus half. And that's already j. That means that there are only two uh, values of m. So the basis that you can form for uh, your angular momentum state will, will be this uh, jm states, half, half, and half minus half. Later on, we'll talk about spins later on when we introduce uh, so this is just an uh, arbitrary uh, angular momentum in this case okay so uh, what happens in this particular case you can form your matrix elements just now and then you'll be able to show that okay your matrix element for jz is given by that okay As you can see that okay there will be a plus a half uh, on the diagonal and minus a half on the uh, diagonal there multiplied by h bar and then your j plus j minus will not be diagonal uh, matrix so you can see that this is above the, the non-zero elements above the diagonal and j minus is uh, the, the sorry the, the non-zero element is above and this is the non-zero element below the diagonal and then with, with j plus and j minus, you can use the, the, the formula above. You can form your j y, j j j x, and j y. And finding your j squared again will be a, a, a what you call a, a diagonal matrix. Okay, and the so diagonal matrix is actually uh, an identity. Okay, so in other words, uh, uh, acting j squared on your angular momentum states are just like uh, multiplying numbers, okay? Then you can go on to the next case, which is uh, uh, the integer case of 1 there. So in that case, your eigenvalues of m goes from minus 1 to uh, plus 1. So there will be three different elements, okay? Minus 1, plus 1 will be 0, plus 1 gives you 1, okay? So there will be basis cats, jm over here, there will be three different ones, and then you'll be able to uh, form the matrix. Uh, sometimes it's good to have uh, a labeling in this case, so let's see. You have to fix the convention, for example, so I normally take this to be the highest eigenstate, 1, 1, uh, 1, 0, 1 minus 1, and then this one will be 1, 1. It has to be the same ordering. 1, 0, 1, minus 1. So what, what does it mean by this? Uh, this labels the, the rows, and this labels the columns. Okay. So you get the ij uh, element of the matrix by forming this kind of uh, matrix. Okay. Uh, so your j plus j minus, just like before, this will be off diagonal. So this one will be above and this one will be uh, below. And similarly, now you can uh, start uh, forming all the other components uh, using your j plus j minus, and you get this. And you can see this is a bit more complicated than the one you have seen for the other operators. Okay. But for your j squared, again, it's a diagonal matrix, which is uh, your matrix will be identity. So in other words, it's the same just by uh, when you act your j squared on the angular momentum states will be the same as multiplying by a number. Okay. Uh, now this is the, 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 the general theory of angular momentum. So uh, in other words, once you have your basis, you can form matrix representations. And uh, there are some other things that I need to recall from the first uh, course. Is the, the case of your orbital angular momentum. 
Now your orbital angular momenta is normally uh, written as this capital L operator, so LX, LY, LZ. Okay. So this denotes that, okay, this is a specific case of the orbital angular momenta, meaning uh, the angular momenta is coming from some kind of rotation motion. Okay. And then uh, with this uh, notation, then you replace your J by L, and then your M stays the same. Uh, sometimes if you have two different angular momenta, then you actually put a subscript on that. So for example, for L, there will be an ML. If there's two different angular momenta of L1, for example, then this will be M1. This will be uh, L2 will be M2 over here. So uh, that, that depends on the situation. So we can juggle between different notations. And then uh, essentially uh, you have the same eigenvalue equation again. Okay. So just replacing your J by L. But important thing that we find uh, since, since L is actually coming from a rotational motion thing, you can actually show that your orbital angular momentum cannot have a half integer spectrum. So in other words, your L will be integers. So that comes to the point of, uh, th that gives rise to the question whether, uh, can you realize uh, the half integer spectrum? So, uh, one of the things that people do very early, in fact, uh, it was a surprise in some sense, uh, very early in the development of quantum theory, is the realization of this uh, idea of spin through the uh, experiment called stern galach experiment. So you bring uh, certain atoms over so here, I think the original case is the silver atoms. You bring it to a particular ground state. So when you have a, 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 the ground state, that means there's, you know, for example, L will be equal to zero, okay? So you do not expect any angular, so any magnetic moment from L equals zero states, okay? So they passed it through some oven and you know, and then uh, some magnetic field. Oh, sorry, not oven, uh, some collimator kind of thing. Okay. But, but no, I'm not doing exp uh, any explanation on the experiments. You can read it. Uh, usually this is done in modern physics. So I hope you have seen some ideas of this. So it goes through an, uh, what you call a magnetic field. So if there are uh, non-zero angular momenta, then you expect there will be magnetic moments, and these magnetic moments will be interacting with the magnetic field, and then the different levels of magnetic moments will give you different lines. Now, if it's a totally classical system, then uh, your magnetic moments will be random. Then uh, the expectation that uh, if you pass it through a, a, a magnetic field, then you get a continuous band kind of thing, uh, corresponding to the random uh, uh, distribution of the magnetic moments. Okay. But in this particular case, what they found is quite surprising in a sense. They found this, uh, this is a real image of the, the experiment. They found two different uh, what I call lines, so to speak. Okay. So now the two different lines uh, is surprising. Okay, first it's, it's coming from a, a, a ground state. So you do not expect it to be the, the magnetic moments to be there and there will be no deviation. But here there is a, a deviation. That's one thing. So there's one uh, is a deviation. Uh, 
And despite uh, being a ground state, it's a delay a bit. Ground state. Secondly, if this is coming from an uh, orbital angular momentum state, remember that the degeneracy that you have is supposed to be 2j plus 1, and j is an integer. So in other words, this will be odd number. But instead, you get uh, the, this, the, the deviation here gives you two different uh, lines. Which is not odd. So that is the surprising thing uh, very early in the beginning of the quantum theory. So uh, the only way to get uh, these two things is to make j equals to half so that you get 2j plus 1 will be equals to 2. But then there is no uh, orbital angular momentum that corresponds to j equals a half. So they attribute this to what they call an intrinsic angular momentum. And uh, it's unfortunately given the, the name spin that might give you the, 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 the picture of a, a, a ball spinning on, on its own axis, which is actually a wrong uh, uh, picture. So there is, uh, spin is, in other words, is some kind of, a, 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 how should I say, it's like a birthmark of a particle. Okay? So you'll be given a particular spin that comes along with the birth of that particle so to speak. So it doesn't correspond to any any form of uh, uh, motion and it's just an, uh, a quantum number. Okay. So in this particular case what they see is actually the, the, the quantum number given to it is just a half. Okay. So, so it, uh, the theory comes later a little, uh, coming from Goldsmith and Ullenbeck uh, and they propose electrons having spin a half and so happens uh, most uh, ordinary matter the ordinary matter particles I'm not sure why this is happening right. slowly ordinary matter particles fundamental particles I should be careful now uh, will have spin a half okay and these are essentially your your in, in statistical mechanics is called fermions okay so your fermions uh, uh, in other words, will not be able to collapse in a sin, what you call in one single quantum state. So it's start of stacking on top of each other. Okay. So and that tells us, okay, okay, maybe it's interesting for us to 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 look at this theory of spin okay, before we go to the something which is more related to uh, experiments later on. Uh, so we can talk about uh, the two spin states, j equals a half, m equals a plus a half, j equals a half, m equals a minus a half. In all notations, they give this by a uh, chi plus and chi minus. The plus correspond to the plus here, minus correspond to minus here. Uh, normally, this is probably used in, in probably in chemistry kind of thing. Uh, uh, more modern notations, they either use a plus or a minus to represent this state. Okay. So, 
one can interchangeably uh, no, change the notations uh, along the way. So this is plus and minus, corresponding to plus and minus here, or sometimes uh, this is again uh, from historical point of view, this is called spin up and this is called spin down. And again, another notation for this, again, I'm, I'm, I don't see any reason why it has to be this, but uh, this is sometimes called the alpha uh, spin state and this is called the beta spin state. Okay, so you have all these different notations to mean the same thing. Okay, and uh, generally, what one has remember that these are basis states, so one can actually form linear uh, superposition of this. Then the general state. Um, not sure where will be down here. Oh, I didn't write. Okay. So your general state, maybe I'll just write it down here, will be given by some uh, combination here, maybe C plus, C minus. Okay, so that will be the general spin state. So these are the base, simply the bases. And this is sometimes called a spinner. Okay. Uh, a spinner is almost like a vector in, in a sense, but uh, it has a different rotational properties that we shall see uh, perhaps in the next lecture. So spinner is a, 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 a something which is not that obvious uh, in a physical sense. Okay. But okay, let let's just go through the, the basic theory behind this. So you have your SZ now acting on your eigenstate will give you a plus or minus H bound to. And one of the things that we always try to do is to, to write this in a more abstract form. Okay. So your SZ can be given in terms of what we call uh, outer bracket or uh, outer products kind of thing. So this is cat bra kind of combination. So that gives you some kind of a projection operator. So your SZ can be actually written down in terms of this. So you can verify that this is actually true by seeing how it acts on the, the eigenstates. Okay. And, and that is just writing in abstractly. Of course, you can always uh, revert back to a specific form. You can put plus to be a 1, 0 and uh, minus to be a 0, 1. Then, uh, this thing will give you what? This, this will give you uh, 1, 0, 1, 0. Okay. And that gives you 1, 0, 0, 0. Okay. And um, minus, minus will give you 0, 1, 0, 1. That gives you zero 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 one. Okay. And you'll find that okay, your SZ, remember there's a minus sign there, so you get your SZ to be this diagonal matrix. Okay. And the same thing for the rest. So I'm not going to go too much. So here's the abstract form for your ladder operators. So the ladder operators, remember for the uppermost state, uh, your M state, uh, your S plus cannot increase the M value, so it gives you a zero uh, action. But if it acts on the lower state, then it increases by uh, one uh, value of H bar, that gives you a plus here. 
and similarly for your S minus the ladder down operator uh, will act on the, the lowermost M state which is given by minus here will give you a zero because it cannot decrease the M value anymore and uh, if it acts on plus it will give you a minus okay so this will be able to give you this equations and in terms of matrices you can actually form in this one like the one you have seen earlier okay so given that you can also write your components as uh, in terms of your cat bra notation here uh, and then this will actually give you the, the right matrix after that by the way if you have questions please shout because I, I can't see you while I'm presenting any questions so far are you still there yeah, no questions, okay so if you have an, any question or any notations that have not no, that was not taught uh, during the, the first course, just let me know, okay? So, uh, spin matrices. And one of the, uh, okay, this is called, again, uh, it's called a uh, polyform formalism, okay? And uh, the, the states are called spinners. And a general state will be given by that. Okay. Right. Uh, one of the things that we can actually see in from these matrices is the fact that I can write it without these constants coming in front. Okay. And this is essentially what we call the poly matrices. Okay. So the relation between the poly matrices with the uh, the, the spin operators are just uh, multiplication by this h power 2. Okay. What's good about these poly matrices is that we, have, we know a lot about them. So one of the things uh, is properties that uh, you should be able to verify this. Okay. The trace of your, your poly matrix is zero. And then if you take the anti-commutator, what is anti-commutator? I'm not sure whether it's been taught. So let me just define it. Sigma I, sigma J is simply sigma I, sigma J plus sigma J, sigma I. So it's just like a commutator, but with a, instead of minus sign, it's a plus sign. Okay. So, uh, so that is the anti-commutator of the poly matrix. So it has a very nice form, simplified form. And for your so for your commutator, uh, it obeys the same thing like your your spin operator. So you have your Lewis-Civita symbol here. Of course, there will be a factor of two because uh, uh, the fact that your your spin operator is h bound to. Okay. And then you take the trace of the product of your sigmas then it gives you this uh, nice uh, it will be related to this okay uh, it, will, it will give you this uh, uh, two delta ij uh, the, the, the product excuse me the product of two poly matrix gives you this uh, Kronecker delta times two uh, a, a much more, uh, how should I say, uh, a much more general thing that one should try to memorize in some sense to, to help you to do calculations. You uh, Remember that your poly matrix have this x, y, z component. Okay. So in other words, your, your sigma can be thought of a vector of matrix, two by two matrix. So I can do a dot product, for example, with another vector. See, so in this case, sigma dot a 
will, will eventually give you from the, from the, the form of your sigma matrix or the poly matrix this particular matrix. So it, the components will be uh, written in this particular form. Okay. And uh, this sigma dot A is related to what we call a spin projection. Uh, we'll talk about this a bit later. Okay. So sigma dot A. Uh, you multiply it with another sigma dot b so in other words uh, there are projections along a there's projection along b multiply in this manner actually gives you a nice identity uh, between a and b uh, the operations involve the the two products that you know for your vectors okay so in other words this gives you a a dot wood a dot b sorry the scalar product and then you have also have your vector product so this is something nice about this uh, polymatrix okay the other thing is polymatrix are hermitian so in other words i can take any hermitian matrix rewrite it in terms of your sigma matrix but i also need the identity matrix to be included so uh, a, a, a two by two Hermitian matrix can always be written down in terms of your poly matrix. Okay, so you get uh, this kind of combination for your uh, elements of that matrix, and you can check easily that this is actually Hermitian. Okay, so you get. Uh, uh, the off diagonal terms uh, are complex conjugate of each other and then your diagonal terms are going to be real okay and uh, one can also see that uh, your trace of a is related to the trace of your sigmas this is trace of a times the identity for example so sometimes uh, people include what we call this uh, polyalgebra Poly uh, algebra. Poly generalized poly algebra. I don't think. Uh, so you have uh, you have the the ordinary sigma one, sigma two, sigma three correspond corresponding to your sigma x, sigma y, sigma z. But they at sigma not. Yeah, which is really your identity matrix okay so in other words uh, any Hermitian operator uh, the 2 by 2 case can be written in terms of this okay and then your your trace okay, or the elements of your matrix will be related, related to the trace of your poly matrix multiplied by your uh, matrix A So that is with respect to the operators. Uh, now let's look into a little bit more details. Uh, I'm not sure, have you done, let me uh, ask you face to face now. Uh, have you done tensor product in, in uh, your first course of quantum mechanics? Pardon? Okay. Okay, so that means I have to uh, well I introduce it in in a in a uh, easy way in this case. Uh, a tensor product so let me go to the one. What? Uh, okay. In set theory for example if you do you have what we call a uh, Cartesian product okay so these are just sets for example I can have a set A and B as one of that so let's call this A and then another set B is uh, alpha and beta here 
के सेट ए क्रॉस बी द कार्टिशन प्रोडक्ट ऑफ ए एंड बी हियर इज टू टेक ऑल पॉसिबल पैस दैट यू कैन एक्चुअली फॉर्म सो हियर वो बी ए आल्फा ए बीटा एंड देन बी आल्फा बी बीटा so this is in terms of a set theory but a set theory doesn't have any features like like uh, a vector so we're going to generalize the idea of cartesian product to what we call a tensor product so what does it do it uh inherits beside uh so you inherit some algebraic properties so one of the things that we know for example for a uh, uh, for a cat okay uh, i can take uh, say cat v and cat w and then i'm supposed to be able to do this so i can do a superposition so alpha b plus beta w so that's an algebraic property okay uh so that algebraic property will will also be included in this idea of tensor product okay so now let's suppose i have this uh let's i uh, let's say i have uh, vw as one set okay just like your set a there so, and then b is a set uh, okay maybe i write as a plus minus okay So what is a tensor product between this set of vectors with this set of vectors? The tensor product is denoted in this manner. Let's suppose okay, uh, just to make things a little bit easier, let's just think of this as a basis and this is another basis. Okay? So this tensor product of these two vector space Okay, will have the similar kind of thing so you get this all these different pairs so I can have for example V tensor product plus V tensor product minus and then W tensor product plus W tensor product minus okay so far this is just saying that okay i have this property just like i have the property of this cartesian product okay so this will be the basis of this bigger vector space a tensor product b but remember uh, as i mentioned the tensor product also inherits the algebraic properties so if i can do linear superposition that means i can do the following for example i can do uh, push the thing upwards so i can start doing this so i have uh, alpha v plus beta w tensor product plus now what it should give me is the following okay similarly i can do the the the, the linear superposition linear superposition with respect to plus and minus and I'll get the same thing. Let me just write it down. So let's do another one. So uh, 
next to uh, V tensor product. What will be a symbol here? Okay, maybe C1, C plus, sorry, C plus, plus, plus C minus, minus. So here is an algebraic property coming from the, the vector space. Okay, just like this one. Okay, and then I can actually form this uh, tensor product this way. Oops, let me. C plus V tensor product plus, plus C minus V tensor product minus. Okay. So what what is a tensor product? It's a tens uh, it's just like a Cartesian product, but it also have all the algebraic operations that comes with it. Okay. So that's all that is. Now, perhaps the uh, a more important notation that one should look at is uh, in terms of say, let's suppose I have a plus given by uh, one zero minus zero, and perhaps I have a uh, two of them. So I will label them first. So I have another one plus two corresponding to a different vector space, Oops. which is one zero again minus two. So it, this this one and two just saying that they belong to different vector space. Uh, zero. So I can talk about say a uh, tensor product of of vector space 1 with ten, uh, vector space 2 okay will be the combination of this uh, plus 1 minus 1 plus 2 minus 2 here okay uh, in, in the in the no in the sense that we define above okay so it's just a pairing but a, a good uh, way to see in terms of matrices what it actually happens so remember what happens here is that your set of bases will be this oops so this is two, two. minus one And you can see the, the basis is, uh, there are four of them instead of just two, okay? There are four of them. So in other words, you can form a linear combination of this basis vectors. But it's nice to be able to write this in terms of a matrix. So what this corresponds to, for example, so I'm going to write this in terms of matrices here. So this will be, uh, okay, maybe I'll write this over here first. Yeah, I'm going to uh, remove the subscript now. Now it seems I've done nothing really. I'm just replacing the, the, the symbols. But I can rewrite this as follows. Okay. This can be written as 1 times 1, 0 here, 0 times one zero here one times zero one here 
0 times 0, 1 here, 0 times 1, 0, and 1 times 1, 0. So be 0 times 0, 1. I hope it gets the right thing. And this is just a, a, a short hand kind of thing. Okay? So what happens that all these matrices which you tensor product can be written as the set of matrices that span a bigger vector space. So this will be 1, 0, so 1, 0 here and 0, 0. This will be 0, 1. This will be zero zero, and this will be zero zero, and this will be one zero, and this will be zero 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 one. So in other words, this goes back to the the familiar no. Basic, uh, four by one uh, uh column matrices. Okay. So essentially, this is just. Uh, what happens when you take a, a, a Hilbert space of dimension M with a Hilbert space with dimension N, uh, the dimension grows bigger by a product. So in other words, the, the tensor product of that two Hilbert spaces will now have dimension M times N. Okay, so that that's all that is. So in other words, it's just like a Cartesian product, but your you have uh, along with that uh, pairing your algebraic properties. So I hope that is clear enough. Do you have any question about this? Uh, I uh, what I'm going to do is probably I will. I think I have a set of notes that explain this uh, a bit more systematically in in my first course. Okay. So probably I'll uh, I'll give this that set of notes along. Okay. Right. Okay. Now let's go back to this. Yeah. When is the the tensor product notation when multiplying? Is it, uh, when? Is it equivalent in the same way that you're multiplying this? Uh, the the matrices are just a representation. Okay, so generally, generally that you have an abstract notation which is given by your caps. Okay, but once your cat are given a representation by a matrix, then you have a matrix. Um, but um, what what uh, just to clarify, doctor, the the, the tensor product notation uh, in the in the document you had earlier, the, the way you multiply the matrices are. Uh, how? I, I didn't get. Multiply the matrices. Is it equivalent to how you would multiply it the normal way? Uh, yeah. not for the tensor product, but but if you have matrices uh, multiplying in 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 in, for example, uh, I converted your tensor product by a four by one matrix, right? And suppose I have an operator as well. Okay, maybe I should show you this thing also. I can talk about so remember our polymetrics earlier? Let me push the thing up a little bit. I can talk about tensor product of operators as well. So in other words, uh, let's consider say sigma one, which is your sigma x tensor product with sigma three to make it things easier okay so uh what is sigma one sigma one is zero one one zero tensor product with sigma three is one zero zero minus one of course you are not going to multiply your two by two matrix with two by two matrix that will give you only a two by two matrix okay the the, the normal matrix multiplication remember that this has to be a mat 
an, an operator acting on a 4 by 1 matrix. Okay, remember that this 4 by 1 uh, vectors here. Okay, so in other words, this operator should be able to act on this vectors. So it should be a 4 by 4 matrix. And in fact, you can use the same trick over here. This 0 is multiplying with this 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And then 1 with 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And then 1 with 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And then 0 with 1, 0, 0, minus 1. And then you can get the 4 by 4 matrix. Okay. So this will be 0, 0, 0, 0. This will be 1, 0, 0, minus 1. This will be 1, 0, 0, minus 1, and then 0, 0. So this will be a 4 by 4 matrix, and this 4 by 4, by 4 matrix will act on this 4 by 1 matrix. Okay? So in other words, the tensor product is just saying that you enlarge the system. Maybe I should also say, when can you have this? Okay, your tensor product are normally done for when you have, suppose your states, okay, your states are given by two independent sets of degrees of freedom. So one one set of degree of freedom is not uh, there's no there's no relationship between one set of degree of freedoms uh, degrees of freedom uh, with the other set of degrees of freedom. Okay, so uh, in this case, for example, uh, the one that I had earlier was I have sorry, let me put it down. Here, I'm considering just like a two spin states, okay? The spin one and spin two cannot have any relationship between each other. So they are independent. Then you can form the tensor product. So I can, I can think of two spin half particles uh, defining a composite system, okay? So I get two spin halves, okay? Uh, what state that you're going to get, you get this four-dimensional state. Okay? Later, we'll, we'll talk about this in more detail. But, but the idea is now your Hilbert space becomes enlarged with more degrees of freedom. Okay? So, so that is essentially what I'm saying here. Uh, then... Uh, can form tensor product. So the idea is always have this independent sets of degrees of freedom. So uh, I've shown here the case of two spins uh, not not dependent on each other. Okay, meaning uh, they are independent spins. Okay. But I can now talk about, let me go back to the notes now. I can talk about, okay, uh, remember your spin has nothing to do with, with uh, your spatial degrees of freedom. It's an intrinsic, it's like a birthmark. Okay, so I can talk about your spin state, describing the spin degrees of freedom. But I can also talk about your position uh, degrees of freedom. Okay. The position degrees of freedom are usually uh, uh, associated to the idea of wave functions. Okay, so I can talk about having both degrees of freedom in one uh, Hilbert space. So I can talk about the the spatial degrees of freedom, and then your your spin degrees of freedom in this way. Okay, so then uh, the 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 state is actually formed by the tensor product of the basis states of each. Okay, 
So what I'm saying, trying to say here is the fact that your spin is now independent from your, your position. I can form what we call a spinor wave function. This is the thing that I wanted to emphasize. Okay? For which uh, you have your basis state uh, defined by your, your basis state of position and then your basis state of your speed. Okay? So your basis state of position will act, <coughs> sorry, will act accordingly to the position operator. So when it acts on R epsilon, for example, over here, will give you just the set of uh, position vectors here. Okay, but if you add S Z, which is your spin operator, the Z component, then we'll get your your plus or minus H bound to. Okay. So they form, uh, uh, in other words, you have this uh, position eigenbasis and you have your spin eigenbasis. Put them together as a compound system, as a you know, uh, composite system, then uh, it becomes what we call, uh, it will form you the, the spin wave functions. So let me just go through. So remember your, your, your position eigenbasis will form the direct delta function. I'm not sure whether this has actually been taught to you. Have you done this? Just yes or no? Pardon? Okay. So uh, perhaps uh, no, okay. Uh, so in other words, uh, okay, let me. So let me just do this. Okay. Uh, Normally, you have a, a, a state given by this psi, for example. How do you relate this with a wave function? Well, what you do is you form the inner product between your, your basis state of position with your psi. So this quantity is no longer a vector. This is actually a scalar, and that scalar is given by this uh, wave function. Okay, remember that this r is now like a variable here. So now whatever scalar that you get over here will be dependent on this r. So this will be your. This is sometimes called a position representation. Okay, why? because you use the position eigenbasis. Okay? But there's something uh, not so nice about position eigenbasis. Okay, one of the things that we have seen, let, let, let me go to 1D first, so that it be one-dimensional case. Okay? Then your uh, R, it just goes to X. Okay, so in other words, what we're going to have is x psi will be just wave function psi x, so one-dimensional wave function. But what is this basis x? Well, it just says that I have this uh, uh, sort of what you call the eigenvalue equation of your position operator. We'll just say that, okay, uh, whatever, the, maybe I put this x dash, okay? Whatever uh, this state is supposed to represent, so this state represents a particle at the point x dash, then this operator will give you the position of that state. So this will be the eigenvalues. Okay? The only problem with this is the fact that, okay, your x dash is a continuous variable in general. 
it's not discrete so you have a problem like what course uh, if you take for example let, let's take the, the, the discrete case of say uh, example that we have seen probably is uh, your uh, what you call how many oscillators did you have seen this right so your m correspond to some level energy level okay and this supposed to be a uh, what you call orthogonal different m and different n they are, they are giving you orthogonal states so in other words uh, you give you it gives you the answer delta n m where when n n m is different it gives you a zero that means it's orthogonal when n and m is the same then it will give you a one so in other words you, know, you are talking about uh, normalized states okay our problem with this is now what actually happens when this is no longer discrete here we give pronecker delta here Okay, which is just 0 or 1. What is the case of say x dash and x double dash where x and x dash and x double dash are continuous? What's the analog of this? Well, that is simply the analog of your direct delta function. Of course, uh, if you have done direct delta function, this is not a nice function. What it looks like is something like this. Okay, this is a point, this is axis x dash, this is the point x double dash. Uh, it's zero almost everywhere, but at the point x double dash, this goes to infinity. Okay, so this is not quite uh, 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 ordinary function that you normally uh, encounter okay so that's why there's something a bit odd when you do uh, eigenstates corresponding to uh, continuous variables so have you seen this before this this thing okay so in other words, uh, you just uh, see uh, how you expand your, your states depends on the basis that you use. So if you use, say, for example, the, the energy states like this one, so I can talk about, say, uh, let's say you take N psi, okay? So this will give you... Uh, some uh, function that depends on this eigen number n okay so this will correspond to usually the energy eigen function okay. so uh, the the basis that you you're choosing over here is the basis of the eigen energies but you could equally choose uh, the basis of the position operator so then this will be a general wave function rather than, sorry, I should not write that. Sorry, sorry. should not write this. So this should be some, uh, some I don't want to write as a wave function. So this will be some, some vector uh, that depends on n. Uh, you can write it's a wave function, but then I, I need to do something else. Uh, what I need to do is, okay, if I want to write this as a wave function, then I'll uh, introduce what we call the identity. Okay. And then this will be a uh, wave function. Sorry. Uh, okay, maybe I'm, there's a lot of things I suppose I have not been taught. Uh, so this will actually give you the, 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 the necessary 
eigen function for that okay but let me just write sorry uh, I'm not sure whether you have seen all this but, but just just to so this will be uh, your wave function okay and this is what we call the eigen function okay so in other words I can write your sine x uh, in terms of say let's consider this as uh, phi n I can reach I can function phi n here so I can always write this as uh, something is not quite right ah okay, okay. Uh, it's not this one uh, Okay, I'll wrap everything off. Okay. Uh, oh no. Uh, so so what happens in the the eigen function things? Uh, let me see. Uh, forgotten. Uh, it's supposed something to be something like this. Suppose I am given this, okay, this I know, uh, and then I want to, uh, okay, not this. Suppose I am given this, okay, now that's better. So this is psi x. But I can now uh, insert the identity operator here. So this is given by psi x sum n from 1 to infinity and n psi. Okay. You know that this completeness relation? You've seen this before? Okay, so the completeness relation, you simply just insert the identity operator in between. So what you're going to have, you're going to have this. And you're going to have that. So these are normally a scalar. So let's say this is called CN. And this will be uh, the eigenfunction phi and x. So in other words, what we have from this equation, we find that your wave function in general can be written in terms of the expansion of with respect to your eigenfunctions. Okay? Now, this whole thing has an analog for the continuous case. The analog for the continuous case would be this, the x, x, x. So now the, the difference between the, the one over here, this is discrete, here is actually continuous. Okay? So all all you need to perhaps all you need to understand is that when you expand uh, your your state psi over here with respect to uh, a position eigenbasis, then you get what we call the position representation, which is just a wave function. There's also uh, what we call the momentum representation. So instead of x over here, you uh, uh, you replace this by your uh, momentum eigenbasis, which could be discrete or even continuous. Okay, then you have your wave function uh, with respect to your momentum here, variable. So again, since you have not seen this before, I will try to attach uh, some notes, uh, the relevant notes, I'm not going to give you all of them. 
the relevant notes with respect to the position uh, representation and momentum representation and uh, the, the relationship between position representation and momentum representation is just a Fourier transform. Did you learn that? I, I remember that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I, I, will, I, will, I will give you the, those set of notes so that, uh, no, probably just to, to help refresh some of the things and then how it fits into this bigger framework. So always think of a state in general is always subject to, okay, what basis do I want to, to use to, to expand that particular state? Okay. So if you use uh, the energy states, which could be a, a discrete one, then basically what you get is essentially like a matrix representation thing. Okay, but if you expand it with respect to the position eigenbasis, which is continuous, then it becomes a wave function. Okay, so I think that's probably the thing that now you you uh, the, the the thing that I wanted to introduce over here, you're combining both. So you have the spin part and you have the, the position part. Okay. So this is again the 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 the, the orthogonality uh, uh, condition. Okay. The only problem is your your derived delta function, of course. Okay? But uh, the 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 completeness relation is just given by that. So now you have to sum over the position basis as well as your spin basis. So now, if you, you actually expand your state psi with respect to the tensor product between your, 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 your position basis and your spin basis, what we're going to get essentially is what we call the spinner wave function. Okay? So the spinner wave function are just wave functions which has two components. Components uh, corresponding to the, the spin up direction and the components with respect to the spin down directions. Okay, so this is with respect to the this thing. Okay, of course, with this, now you can also define the adjoint. The adjoint is just simply what? The adjoint is just simply taking the, the dual vector, the bra vector. And then expand it again in terms of your your position eigenbasis and the spin basis. And then you get the psi at join given by here is a two by one matrix of functions. These are functions, top and bottom. Here you have a one by two uh, matrix of functions. Okay, so the relationship between this. It's just the complex conjugate and then the transpose. Okay, so this is what we call the spinner wave functions. I haven't told you what, how this can be different from vectors. Okay, that should be the next lecture. So. Once you have that basis, okay, uh, which is a tensor product between the position and spin, I can also do uh, inner product. So the inner product will be what? The inner product will be the integral that finds the overlap between one wave function, one spinner wave function, with the other spinner wave function. But of course, the other one will have to be uh, taken the adjoint. Okay. So in the end, this thing is supposed to be a scalar, right? So a scalar cannot depend on any variable. So it has to be integrated over R. So this will be integrated over R. This will be integrated over R. That gives you one number over here and then another number. Over here. Okay. And the normalization is just taking psi and psi here that corresponds to the, the spinner wave functions having this normalization condition. So instead of just one single, usually what you have is this, psi, psi equals to integral of the x 
sine star x sine x I have enough space okay and that uh, you have the normalization normalization condition equals to one right so this is the normal wave function without any spin components but now when you introduce spin you have this uh, conditions coming in this is the spin up component this is spin down component so you have to sum these two uh, to normalize the spinner wave functions just to give you some thing is uh, it's a free particle energy eigenstate of spin up okay it's given by uh, you remember a uh, free particle energy eigenstate is given by uh, a plane wave so your plane wave will be multiplying with the spin up state or if you want to spin down, you just have the plane wave multiplying with the spin down. So this will give you the, the components of your spin away wave function, psi plus and psi minus. So if you add the Hamiltonian, for example, the Hamiltonian just uh, usually your happiness, Hamiltonian doesn't depend on spin, then it will just give you the kinetic energy. Okay, But if you uh, add on it the spin operator then it will give you the eigenvalue of the spin so that's essential for it is. Okay. same thing here is the z component so generally you have uh, a much more uh, general state for your spin superposition rather than just up and down then you will just multiplying the, the coefficients over here Psi plus with psi plus, sorry, chi plus with psi plus, chi minus with psi minus. So that will give you a general uh, superposition of spin states. Okay. And I think it's just the same over here. So generally you have that. Uh, I think the, the one you probably have come across before is that your hydrogen atom, for example, are just labeled by this. Right? This is your principal quantum number, angular momentum quantum number, and then this is your uh, magnetic quantum number. Okay? But if you include spin, then you have this another, another, I call another two set of quantum numbers there. Okay? Uh, how is it so far? I mean, uh, I hope it doesn't scare you away from this course. <laughs> okay. You have any questions? Uh, maybe later on when you do the problems, probably it'll be a bit more. Uh, that's what I'm about. <laughs> yeah. Because uh, uh, these are just the theories. Okay, uh, you should be able to apply. Uh, the main thing is that you know all your basic uh, cat and bra operate uh, what you call manipulations so it's just continuous from that okay the only thing that probably you have not uh, done uh, in a detailed sense is the position thing and I'm not sure about that so I'll give you the notes so essentially the position thing is just thinking of in terms of uh, expanding the, the state in terms of a position basis. So that's all it is. Okay. Uh, I think it's too late to take a break, right? <laughs> Shall we continue? So let's just finish this thing off, I suppose. All right. Let me see where we are going. Ah, okay. More things. Uh, right. Uh, one of the things that one can do, for example, is the fact that usually what happens is uh, when you do the Stern-Galak experiment, for example, you, know, you have this uh, 
uh, beam of uh, atoms undergoing some kind of uh, uh, so magnetic field here okay and then it splits up into two and uh, this direction is taken as Z but there's no real necessity of taking this to be Z okay it can be any direction so you you are supposed to be able to write down your spin in any component in any sorry in any direction so suppose I have a, a general direction n instead of so now you replace this z by n one should be actually be able to do that by just taking the dot product between your spin operators remember that your spin operators there are three components as x as y as z with the, the components of your uh, direction of vector okay just like sz okay sz is simply what sz is simply s dot k right and you have one sx and this is s dot i so this project is along the z direction this project is along x direction so if I want to project in a general direction, I just take the, uh, the dot product between uh, the spin operator and the, the direction vector n here. Okay? So the direction vector n here can be given in terms of the, the polar coordinates in this way. So remember spherical polar. So here's direction n. So this will be phi and this will be theta. Okay. So the x part will correspond to the sine theta cos phi, the y part is sine theta sine phi, and the z part will correspond to cos theta. So now one can have this s component spin component in the n direction. It's just given by this uh, uh, dot product and your s is essentially your poly matrix so you can actually give it, give it a, a, a matrix representation in this way okay so that will be able to, to, to generalize things a little bit in your calculations uh, just like okay uh, just to make the analogy okay so if you remember as z acting on, on, on some uh, eigenstate here, plus or minus, gives you h bar on 2, plus or minus. So the natural question is, okay, if as z has this plus or minus, can I have an eigenstate correspond, corresponding to s n? Well, you can. And apparently, if you do some kind of matrix diagonalization also, but, but never mind, uh, uh, the, the answer is going to be this. This will be the, the eigenstate of Sn corresponding to a plus, and this will be the eigenstate of Sn corresponding to a minus. Okay? So that sort of... Uh, sums up the things that you need to know for a general spin okay all right i have a few more things to do maybe uh, i'll let you digest this for for a moment and then we'll continue the next lecture on qubits which is going to be easy okay so I'll let you digest it for a while and then uh I was wondering whether you, uh, how to make this a bit more interactive. There is a platform, whether you want to try it or not, uh, called, I uh, can't remember what it is. It's called, let's 
tank. Maybe I'll go to my Facebook <laughs> for a while. Uh, are you seeing this? Okay. No. Ah, yeah, Perusol. Uh, I, I have not tried this, but uh, according to, to the review given by some academics abroad, yeah, uh, one can use this parasol, so, so I've given you a set of notes, then you can actually make interactive comments on that set of notes. You want to do that or no? This is not the like, question. Like individual annotation. Yeah, yeah, it. yeah. You can do it uh, using your Acrobat, of course. Uh, you, no, using just normal PDF. But over here, people can share your annotations. Okay, and then you st start doing it like a, a social media kind of, you know, you know, one person get, starts commenting and then the person adds another comment kind of thing. I've not tried this, but you no, know, if you feel like trying this out, then we can do it. Uh, we can try it out. <laughs> okay, uh, it's up to you. I mean, it's not, it's just something that, you no, know, uh, I, I just want to make it not, not to be just one way. Uh, let me figure out how to use this also, because I have not tried it. And maybe you can try it yourself as well. Pardon? Yeah, is it free? Yeah, it's free for ed academic institutions. So I probably have to log in using my, using your own university email, I suppose. So, uh, but, but okay, let's leave this just, uh, no, something that can be done on our spare time. Okay. At the moment, you have your notes. Okay, I need to update the notes. There are some uh, corrections there. So, uh, but later on, uh, when you get those notes down, then then you can start thinking whether you want to do this or not. Since there are only two of you, I mean, if there are many of you, then probably it's better stay. Maybe for relativity or something like that. Okay. So I think I'll stop there for today. You have any questions before we, st we stop? In general, um, do you happen to know when that banking, the land banking is going to happen for our faculty? Land banking? Uh, for what? supposed to come back because we have a lab uh, workshop or something. Maybe we have to back to Yeah. It okay, uh, about that. I'm, I'm afraid not because uh, those are probably, uh, these are meant for the, the those having lab uh, classes, right? <laughs> okay, uh, that, that's another thing that probably, uh, you have to tell me whether you want to come in or not. Uh, no, and then, no. Since theoretical, no, you don't have to come to the lab. <laughs> it's clear. Pardon? Hypothetically speaking, are we allowed to go into faculty? Unit permission. So they, they are giving, uh, usually uh, at the beginning of the week, for example, today, they will start asking for, uh, do you want any of your students to come in? Usually it's for those uh, uh, students that have that work but in your case no uh, i'm not sure maybe you have classes that 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 requires lab so that's probably the thing that you mentioned about the faculties uh, workshop thing uh, then probably you have to no you have to have a, a letter saying that you can come into the, the campus just like me uh, they have this rotation thing uh, uh, for academic staff to come in. So I've been assigned tomorrow. I'm supposed to be assigned today, but I asked so that I can do this at home. Okay. Uh, I'm supposed to come every Tuesday to the, the, the faculty. So I have a letter saying that, okay, uh, this person is uh, having uh, this rotation to come to the faculty on this day. 
And I guess uh, for students, it would be the same. Okay. That's the thing I'm not sure. Usually, uh, for me as a supervisor now, if, if I'm a uh, supervisor for your final year project, then I can actually ask for I call permission for your stu for the students under me. So you go back to the supervisor. Uh, the, the problem is, uh, okay, you, you are not allowed to, uh, there are some conditions. So if you, uh, you are just, uh, I'm not sure what the conditions are, okay, I'm just uh, guessing here. Probably uh, you can only come to the faculty but not go to the college or something like that, you know, that kind of thing. So you are only uh, allowed to come to one place and not other places. So, well, even for us, no, uh, we are not really allowed to you know, stray around the campus too much. The idea is to restrict the movement on the campus. So um, my turn is going to be tomorrow, so I'll be there in the faculty. Uh, but if you want uh, to come for some reason, just let me know. I suppose I have not tried this yet, because so far my students are all theoretical. <laughs> okay, so. Uh, and they have not asked for, for coming into the campus. Okay, I'll, I'll find out, yeah, and if I know anything, I'll uh, let you know. Uh, perhaps the, the, the WhatsApp, I can start for the final year project thing. Timothy, you're under whom? Your FYP? Okay. So uh, I will start hours soon, okay? Okay. All right, I think I'll stop now. Okay, thank you everyone. See you next next Thursday, is it? Thursday, right? Yeah, I think yeah. so. Still yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, see you then. Thank you, Doctor. Bye. Oh hang on. Attendance. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I need to 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 have a record. Uh, by the way, if you can encourage others to take it, it'll be good. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is a the good time to to uh, to take at one subject because everything is done open book and things like that <laughs> okay it helps that everything's recorded yeah yeah, yeah. so we can like uh, re -re watch lectures all right okay so i hope uh, i'll get this upload later on okay all right bye